Hey everyone, I'm Jason Del Rey, and this is Code Commerce at Home. In fact, you are looking at my home. Uh, probably not one of the most picturesque homes you've seen in a while, but uh, I am a journalist, and so we make do. Um, I'd love to be in person with all of you right now. I know a lot of our attendees have attended my events in New York City, and hopefully we can get back to something live in person next year. But I'm really excited about the slate of guests we have over the next few weeks, and I really like the intimate feel of this as well. Um, first thing I just want to do quickly is thank our sponsor, Klarna, who's helping us make this event series happen. Secondly, I want to remind our guests, for those who have not been to our live events, audience questions are a big part of what we do and what make our events, I think, more, vib more vibrant than a lot out there. Um, you should have a field where you can type in your questions along with your name. And at the toward the end of our conversation today, uh, I'll, I'll pick and choose, but hopefully get to as many as I can uh, for our guest. Speaking of our guest, I'm delighted to have here today with us Nancy Green, who's the head of Old Navy. Nancy's been at Gap Inc. for a long time in various roles, previously at Old Navy in the past, but also running Athleta, um, one of Gap Inc.'s fastest growing brands. Nancy, great to have you today. Thanks, Jason. It's great to be here with you and everybody out there. So um, I just want to start. This is called Code Commerce at Home. That kind of looks like it might be an office bookshelf. Where are, where are you right. today? I'm in our San Francisco headquarters. My uh, tech stability at home wasn't quite uh, reliable enough for today. So made the decision. I, I come into the office either every other week or every week once a day just to uh, do some some work and see a few people. We're operating at extremely low capacity here, but the office is open at a very small scale. And we'll we'll get to some of that later. I'm I'm really interested in finding out how a product company that where you need and want to touch and feel uh, merchandise is operating pretty much virtually today. Um, but first, I thought it was important for our guests maybe to just set the stage and rewind a bit um, even before this crazy year of 2020 and, and go maybe to 2019. Um, so old, there was a plan last year for Old Navy to spin off from Gap Inc. into its own company. Um, in early 2020, I believe, um, those plans were actually reversed and it was decided Old Navy would remain part of Gap Inc. Um, then in early March, uh, the CEO of Old Navy becomes CEO of Gap Inc. You rise to to the top role at Old Navy. I believe this was March around March fifth. This is announced. Is that correct? Yeah, or a little later. Okay, maybe yeah, a, middle of okay. March. Yeah, and March. I, I remember still Wednesday, March eleventh is. Um, I don't know if you want to call it like pandemic Wednesday or something really awful, where it seems like the U.S. really mainstream you know, America realizes what this pandemic's going to be. That's the day I remember the NBA decided um, to postpone the rest of the season. And the other thing I remember for better or worse is Tom Hanks announcing uh, that, that, um, that he had the virus. And so a lot of things happening at once. I'm wondering for you, what was the moment when you and your team at Old Navy realized like, this thing is a big deal and business as usual is basically gone. Yeah, I think it was, we're, we're ahead of the curve in San Francisco. Remember viruses were spiking here early. And so we were preparing to shelter in place before the San Francisco ordinance for shelter in place came in. And, and it was the first county um, in the country to to issue that. So I think that was when it started to really get real. And this was literally three days after I stepped into my new role, the entire senior leadership at Gap Inc. stepped into their new roles. So it was happening really fast. You know, we, we've we been watching it closely and it, it you know, when it was in just really um, more of an issue in China because it was having major disruption to our manufacturing right. uh, supply chain. 
but uh, now now it's here and it's spreading very quickly in San Francisco and beyond. And we're closing our offices. And now the decision is coming quickly on what to do with stores. So, so in those days, how are you, you're, you're not only making big, huge, like huge decisions with um, big impact on your employees, um, also your customers, but you you have to do this really quickly, right? There's not yeah. a ton of time. So like, yes. how do you? How are you organizing then to make that happen while yeah, we, while also frankly like I'm on a personal level I don't know about you but like I was struggling to keep my sanity during those first couple of weeks in March Yeah everything is coming at you really fast I mean the, the I think the best thing we did was quickly organize two command central teams one for Gap Inc where we had to move and be extremely coordinated across all brands uh, and then the other one was within Old Navy which we called our lemonade team because uh, we were going to make lemonade wow. of, out of whatever lemons were coming at us. Lots of it, lots of lemons this lots year. Lots of lemons. Yeah. And, and as we know, totally unprecedented. And you do have to make decisions quickly. You have to make decisions thoughtfully. And so we had some core tenants making sure that we were paying attention to trend lines and not headlines. And not letting the emotion of everything get in the way of making really smart, rational, and thoughtful decisions. Because... We all knew that there were going to be big consequences with whatever big decisions we were going to make, and we had to be ready for those. And we didn't know how long. I right. mean, when we were making the decision to close stores, we didn't know how long we were. We, we all thought what were you thinking? Initially. Yeah, what were you thinking? I think we all thought it would probably be three weeks, wow. you know, and it ended up being, you know, in some, you know, at least two months, and in some cases, stores for much longer. And so when that start, that became sort of the next big thing to once we knew. We can't, we're not ready to open these stores or we can't because of um, government mandates uh, in, in various states and, and county by county. We had to make decisions, you know, immediately the e-commerce business took off and we, we operate on the fourth largest apparel e-com platform. So when you, when you start to double your e-commerce business on a very large base, right. The operations and the ability to meet that customer demand coming so quickly um, in a very different way, you, you've, you've got to quickly you know, react and, and re-gear a lot of, of how you run your business. So, so two, que two questions here. One is, um, you, know, you mentioned in some jurisdictions you're being forced to close. Your Old Navy and Gap and apparel retailers are not deemed essential, right? So in that moment, you're watching Target, Amazon, Walmart, um, big giant companies to some of, and in, in, in some aspects, competitors with their either their own apparel brands or those of others they sell. They are like they're open for business, you know, in store and online when it comes to all of them and Amazon specifically. Like what what is going on, you know? in your mind and sort of leadership team mind, is there, are you thinking of ways to try to be like, try to make a case for being essential? Like how, how much is that, you know, that dynamic sort of on your mind and your priority list, you know, during that period of time? Yeah. I mean, there are, there are several things on your mind and, and one of them absolutely is that and making sure that there's not unfair advantage being given. Um, so, we had to work very closely with with government um, agencies in San Francisco, you know, the the, the Nash, at the national level and across states. Um, what was really really important, though, is we most important is we had to figure out how to make sure when we were ready to open stores that we were going to be very aggressive about being able to open safely um, and give confidence to our employees and to our customers so that we they could trust so what is, us. What does that look that like? We so what does that look like? Well, well, safety protocols, I mean, none of us had ever, ever done anything like this. So you're figuring out we had to put sneeze guards in, you know, the plexiglass right. um, separation, higher, uh, creating much a uh, higher level of cleaning protocols with um, adding additional cleaning staff hours, all of that. So maintaining social distancing how to communicate that to customers, um, wearing masks. So we had to retrain our sales teams, our store teams on how to do that and how to get ready for that quickly so that we could immediately be ready as uh, 
community, uh, you know, county by county mandates were shifting and we could be ready to open. And we did a great job. We were able to open very, very quickly. And that made a huge difference while also managing, you know, this huge e-com demand. And fortunately, we were set up with strong, you know, omni capabilities. So we were able to we were able to use store inventory to fulfill online orders. And so getting people into the stores, you know, while we were closed to the public, we were actually filling a tremendous amount of customer um, orders through our stores. Yeah, and wanna, we, and we scaled our um, curb, our curbside pickup capabilities immediately within two weeks. You know, we had had that operation running, you know, fully, fully up for Old Navy and then and then to the other brands scaling it. So it was really important for us to think about what are the options that we have to provide for our customers so that we can service them on their terms. And then how do we make sure that we have great empathy for our employees and our teams that we're doing everything we can to keep them safe. So I want to dive into some of that, um, some of the uh, stuff you referenced in, in regards to the online business and that ramping up. I, I believe maybe at the beginning of store closures, uh, you might have um, decreased the uh, the shipping threshold. I think that's back to normal now. But in the last earnings uh, call, which I guess was for uh, the, that release was for um, sort of the middle of the, uh, the April, May, and June months of the year, um, there, were ac- there was actually a reference that you didn't have to, uh, all, all the brands at Gap Inc. didn't have to do as many promotions um, because yeah. the demand the demand was there. And so I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about how you drove demand to online if you needed to. And we'll talk about masks, but maybe outside of the mask business. Um, and then how you're thinking about that delivery from store going forward, because I know it is more expensive than sort of delivering from a centralized uh, location. Yeah, it, it definitely is more expensive. Well, we made the decision that we were going to service our customer first and foremost, and we were going to meet that demand. We were very fortunate. Our product category and our product is very, very strong. And we are in categories that our customer, we're highly relevant to our customer. We have a big active business, very a lot of comfort, casual products. So there was there was some natural demand coming to us because of the product categories we were in. And we were able, able to really quickly pivot um, more dramatically towards those categories to drive that online demand. You know, it was digital marketing, email. Um, we we just unconstrained, you know, whatever, you know, there was out there. You know, we, we knew that we had the ability to really go after and uh, support this this opportunity. And we did through through digital marketing, through email, but it it starts with the relevance of your product and, you know, very relevant uh, messages to your customer. And then the other thing- What what was the messaging that you were, that that you shifted to maybe? Well, what was really important for us is, you know, Old Navy is a values purpose led brand. And we wanted to make sure that we were deeply connecting with our community and our customers. And so we wanted them to know that we were right there with them community by community. So early on in the crisis, we recognized that, you know, we we knew we were going to have challenges. Inventory was not in the right place. And I did not, and my team did not want to have to unnecessarily, you know, liquidate inventory when we knew that there was going to be a demand and a need for American families who, who needed clothing and were losing their jobs. And so we made a decision to donate $30 million worth of clothing within a few weeks of, um, of the crisis. And, and, and this clothing, to, to be clear, this clothing was, was not going to be the type of clothing that would be in demand for sale, or was it a seasonal thing? What, what, no, it was, it, what was, was currently in our, in our stores and our it. stores were closed. And so we didn't we didn't want to we didn't want to unnecessarily have to do something with it that wouldn't wouldn't be good for our business. But also, more importantly, we could put it to good use because we knew there was a need. We have a we partnered with the foundation and we we had a couple nonprofit uh, partners that that needed this product. And so we organized and worked with them and and made a substantial donation and we shared we shared that message and that message was received really positively by our customers um so acting with your values and sharing we also we talked about the safety protocols we messaged that you know what we were doing when we were ready to open stores we talked about 
you know, we, I mean, there were things that we did really well. There were things that, you know, were, were tough, like, you know, well, really yeah, what, what are some of those? Yeah. I think what was tough is that the enormous, um, you know, remember you're operating DCs that also have to maintain social distancing. The demand is doubling. So you're adding, you know, adding shifts, but you've got to make sure it is safe for the employees that are working in our distribution centers. We obviously got our stores geared up to ship from store, as I shared earlier. Um, but it took a while still, you know, there were backlogs in shipping and there were backlogs in, in returns. And we had to gear up our call center support, our chat support. You know, people are like, where's my package? Why is it taking so long? Customers, you know, not everybody understood the magnitude of, of what it was taking to deliver products on time. So so that was that was a big challenge for us to be able to communicate with our customers and help them understand what we were trying to do um, safely and, you know, expediently for them. What what um, you know, you had to ramp up the the out of store delivery or from store delivery out of necessity. Right. And um curbside pickup was something that had to ramp up out of necessity. Speaking about those two things specifically, like what what will remain and there will there be a need for and make economic sense? And what what sort of changes as you move into sort of a new phase, hopefully, of of the impact of this pandemic? Yeah, I think both both are here to stay. I mean, they were there. Uh, curbside was just we were just on the front end of it. So ship, we've had shift from store capabilities for right. gosh, I think it's been three years. Um, so so the important thing for us is nobody knows what's on the other side. It's we're in a ho- highly volatile environment. Nobody can predict what's happening, you know, three months from now. So we just have to stay very agile and responsive and be ready. Uh, so we're we're ready to handle what whatever we have to handle from ship from store. We're looking at ways. Um, obviously, the, the most important thing is to get the right level of inventory that can be filled through the online DCs. So you don't have to incur those additional expenses through, uh, you know, ship from store. But there's a lot of, you know, we're looking at more automated ways to do that and bring bring those costs down. The do most you, important thing is is focusing on the agility and the speed in terms of how, how we can respond. I, I think I think I saw that the online business grew, I think, 130 percent in the plus. 137 percent. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in Q2. Um, where do you see that number, that growth going, if you can, if you can say it all? And also, is there a need for, does this, has this forced you to think about more distribution centers or are you okay with what you have today? Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't share too much other than what we did know is through our business in China. So we operate, Gap operates stores in China and we had the advantage of watching what was happening in China and seeing that as stores were opening, the e-com demand was not not falling. And so we knew that you know, some of these uh, patterns were new behavioral patterns that were accelerating because of COVID. But once you start to change behavior, a lot of it sticks. So you know, we, we, we see very high levels of, of growth and demand coming from e-com. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be for a while. And, uh, and, you know, again, the level of that, you know, may change up or down, but it's at, it's at a step function change from where it was prior to COVID. Um, one of the numbers that got a lot of attention out of the last earnings at Gap Inc. was uh, the, the sales of masks across the, the Gap Inc. brands. Um, I think the number was around $130 million in three months across the four Gap Inc. brands, I believe. Um, it was not broken down by brand, but if Old Navy's around half of total Gap Inc. sales, um, may, maybe it looks something like half of that number. Can, can you explain a little bit about how the mask business got started and whether it was sort of an inventory use thing or a material use thing or a need or some combination? Yeah, it started, uh, I had a four or five days into our shelter in place. Kaiser reached out to us. We knew that there was critical PPE uh, shortages happening in hospitals. For those who don't know Kaiser, can you just, can you just. Kaiser is uh, a hospital system in California with uh, multiple hospitals. Uh, And they reached out because to us and said, you know, we were, we are short on masks and critical PPE. 
you have large manufacturing supply chain relationships. Can you help us source source masks? And so we asked them for the spec and we immediately picked up the phone and did some homework with our teams, our sourcing teams in Asia. And we were able to source millions of, of masks for Kaiser you know, very, very fast. And that led to an opportunity because we wanted to be part of the solution. We were like, how can we help? You know, everybody is reading and watching the news with, you know, critical shortages for healthcare workers. And I, my parents were, my father was a physician. My mother was a public health nurse. And so this, this was really close to home for me. So we, you know, we said, how can we help? What can we do? So that was the first place that we were able to help. Um, and for not just Kaiser, for other hospitals in New York um, and, and governments, too, that, that needed help for, for essential workers. Well, what, it, what we then learned is that from watching what was happening in China, where, where all of you know, Chinese citizens wear masks to protect themselves from not just COVID, but in general, airborne viruses. And it's, it's very common in Asia. Um, and, and so we started to think that this is going to be very important for customers in the U.S. And we started to, you know, really just watch the trend lines and realize we had a huge opportunity to quickly start to move into manufacturing our own masks um, that we not only, you know, for customers, but, you know, we have also set up a, a B2B business where we could, again, be part of the solution and put our supply chain to, to great use to help um, you know, support a huge need that was out there. And again, in customer relevance, biz, you know, people, human relevance. So this, is, and, so, this, so this is a business that you, like how, I, I know no one has concrete answers, but how are you planning ahead in terms of like how signif I, significant of a business this will be ongoing? Yeah, I mean, we're, we again, like speed and agility is everything in this business. So we have a highly flexible, highly, you know, agile supply chain where we can react, you know, within five weeks to demand. And so we can watch it very close. And it's a it's it's a huge business for us. It is it is a very, very material business for us. And we you know, we we react to it every single week. Uh, and we're learning every week what customers respond to. I have one of the old Navy masks here, and um, it's fun. It's also a very emotional business. I mean, she, our customers love the prints and the patterns. It's not just functional. They're, it's becoming a style um, statement as well. People are mixing and matching their patterns with, with, their, with their clothes, and you know, people are having fun with something that they're now getting used to wearing all day, um, every day. And, and I think there will be some degree of it that will stay because I think we'll start to learn even as the flu season starts to come right. upon us that masks are very effective for airborne viruses and infectious diseases. And so I think there, sh there likely could be some level of appetite for this well beyond when we're all vaccinated next Got year at some point. And, and um, you're, you're talking about things that might stick a little bit, right? Like there, there's a chance that post vaccine people are still you know some people are still want uh, in an array of masks to have in their home um what other sort of consumer trends obviously there's online shopping but you know when it comes to apparel specifically like what are the trends that you think will stick or you're planning to stick in some sense and how are you how is your business change or evolving to to follow that trend yeah, I think we're at the intersection of major macro lifestyle change uh, and trends, and that is that wellness and health and wellness has never been more important. I think you know a health crisis, a pandemic, certainly wakes everybody up to the importance of health and wellness. So, so products that support health and wellness are critical. Our active business, restorative businesses, you know, things that help you feel good, comfortable, um, those are here to stay. Uh, and then, you know, I think it's 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 just, you know, people there's been a casual casualization trend that's been going on for decades right. in America. And I think with the new change with work from home, we know that on the other side of this, the future of work is going to look very differently than what it looked like you know prior to COVID. I think working from home and all of the technology capabilities that we have right now has showed us what's possible. And so I think how people dress will reflect uh, 
lifestyle changes that are that are here to stay. And that's that's what we do as a brand. We have to stay very close to what that means for our customer, what it means for our product categories and what it means for the messages and the experiences that, you know, we serve up. So that, that so it it sounds like like what what's coming and what's already here when it comes to you know dressing is sort of old Navy, you believe is old navy sweet spot already and there's not much either expansion or or depth to I I don't know I guess um, I'm wondering great, no there's great expansion opportunity um, no it's huge I mean you know we have I, very- I meant sort of in product assortment not necessarily growth but oh no yeah. there. Great. Yeah. There is. There's new categories that we're experimenting with and testing, and and as those te- you know take hold, we'll scale those. Uh, and again, that that meet those macro trends that I described. I I, I can't you know share too much about them because uh, they're in development. But we see the we we see the active trend uh, and this comfort trend. This is a massive acceleration on what we're seeing, and it's not going away. It's just going. It's going to materially change people's behavior again because of the intersection of what that means to people's um, psyche and the importance of health and wellness so what it, it just it creates a, a, a huge growth opportunity for us I'm gonna get to some some viewer questions in a little bit but I, I want to talk about physical stores for a second um, when Old Navy was originally planning to spin off from Gap Inc there was sort of a big growth plan when it comes to when it came comes to the number of stores. Um, I think it was almost almost doubling Old Navy's store print, uh, store footprint. Um, I'm wondering now that spin offs not happening. And also um, with the pandemic hitting, what like what do stores have to do differently than maybe you, you would have thought a year ago? And how is Old Navy thinking about the need for more stores or not? Yeah. Stores are very important still. I mean, we see the the most valuable customers are omni-channel customers. They're customers that shop both online and stores. Right. They shop at a much higher um, level of frequency than a single channel customer. So that is that is why stores are important, is because you're creating options for where customers, you know, want to access the brand. So for us, it's really about making sure that every store is in the right location where it's relevant, we're, we're advantaged. We have a significant portion of our fleet that is off mall, which is- Don't wanna be, don't wanna be in a mall today. Well, I think that you can see that it's easier and this has always been Old Navy's strategy. It's easier to be able to pull your car up um, to a parking spot and, and walk right in a store. And especially our customer has kids. She's a busy mom and time is precious to her. And so she wants to be able to come in, be, you know, treated well, find what she wants, have some fun with her kids and, and, you know, get out and go to her car versus, so that's, that's an advantage. And that's, that's very important. So again, it's about um, making sure that we're really thoughtful about where we're putting stores and there's still plenty of opportunity in markets where we're not in today um, that we, we should have stores. So we're not, we're not, we're not stopping stores. We're just being very thoughtful of of where where the relevance is going forward. So no specifics on expansion or in terms of store count. Uh, we'll, we'll share we'll share uh, later. We're not ready to share that specifically now. Okay, we'll have to do this again. Um, what about what stores like? How s- stores serve customers? What features and services they have? Um, changes you've made during COVID that that may have to stick? Any anything you can talk about there in in terms of what a store does for a customer and how that might change or is changing? Yeah, I I, I think it's really important that uh, that stores are a place where customers uh, feel that human connection. So you, we, we have to think about what can a store do that cannot be accompl- accomplished online? And how do we more seamlessly connect them through uh, digital capabilities? But the human connection in a store is very powerful. So, so that's how we think about it. And then there's a convenience aspect also that is very important to a store in that you know, that's why curbside is valuable. That's why buy online and pick up in store is very valuable. Um, 
you can make a return really quickly. If you buy online, you can return it very quickly in stores. So, so making sure that, that we're depends really on the store. Some, some, some return experiences in store. Not. Well, come check out our new return experience. Because okay. We're doing a great, a great job, but you know, creating, how is it, how is it different? Do you, can you explain? Um, well, we're just making sure that we have, you know, separate areas, convenience, you know, hubs and calling it the convenience spot. You can see it. Um, in wherever your local store is so that we make sure that she can she can come in she can make that return again like she comes in sometimes with kids you know do the return see the credit processed and then be able to walk through the store and shop comfortably you know with or without help depending on what she wants um, and then check out you know seamlessly so so that's that's how we look at it is what is the human aspect um, of, that's really important and that our that are, you know, our store employees, they are our greatest, they are our brand ambassadors. They are the greatest assets we have. And, and that making sure that, you know, they're, you know, really energized and excited and so positive. I mean, there's nothing better than going into an old Navy store. You feel the energy and the positive vibe. Our sales associates um, are amazing and they are ambassadors in front of our customers and for our brands. So that's really important. Okay, I'm going to grab a couple of reader uh, viewer questions. Got to change my mindset. Um, and then uh, I may have one or two at the end. So here's one. Um, uh, we don't have a name, uh, but uh, Old Navy is known as the go to affordable family shop for back to school. How are you engaging with families struggling with all the uncertainty across the country right now as some people go back to school and others don't? Yeah, I mean, this is on our mind. Uh, first of all, um, you know, this is part of great empathy and, and every, you know, we've got our, the employee experience and then we have our customer experience. So just, you know, just starting just with our employee experience, we know that we have to make sure that everybody is in a unique situation dealing with whatever they're dealing with working from home. And so being very, very empathetic to our employees needs and the flexibility that is, that is needed. Um, so that's number one. Uh, and then our customers, it is really just making sure like, you know, our product categories offer the range of kids that, you know, are, are studying from home. And th those are the types of products they want to, you know, active and comfortable clothing for kids to be sitting in front of, you know, Zoom screens or whatever those video screens all day are similar to what adults are <laughs> wanting to wear in front of their work screens all day. So it's really it's very, you know, it's, it's making sure we have the balance and that we can meet the relevant needs of, of both situations. And, and I'm curious if, since, you know, in a lot of places, there's not the same back to school shopping surge, has that negatively impacted your business or does the type of apparel you, you sell sort of offset that because people want to be comfortable at home as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely the patterns are changing. So what we're what we're seeing is you you, you don't have the peaks, um, the typical peaks where there's this surge and then you know things change. So we're just seeing uh, week by week, month by month, things things look differently. Uh, but overall, it's 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 not a concern. Okay. We have, um, this was, this was something that's been on my mind a lot, but I, I won't steal Nick's thunder because he's the one asking it. How have the accelerations in e-com buy online, pick up in store and other technologies to conduct business in COVID, during COVID altered your thinking about how fast you can scale new things. And, and I just want to give some context here of like what I've been thinking about, you know, there's there, a lot of big retailers had curbside pickup, for example, on a roadmap for, you know, a couple of years out. And then suddenly it's alive within, you know, four to six weeks or something like that. I, I know you were, you that had some us. of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit about what, the realizations in terms of scaling that you, that you may yeah. now recognize. I think this has forced us to act with a level of speed that we have never seen before because, you know, it, you just have to, I mean, you get so laser focused when you're in a situation like this, where this is about, if you don't figure this out, you can't create an option that is absolutely essential for your customer to, to do business. And so that's how we looked at it. And, and the speed in which we are solving customer problems and solving opportunities 
is unprecedented for us. And I'm incredibly proud. This takes a, a tremendous cross-functional effort and focus and discipline to be able to do, but we've, we've seen and we've proved that we can scale so much faster. Is there now, is there a mechanism in place to make sure like when necessary that, that type of thinking or execution sticks or can be applied to other technologies at all? Yes. I mean, I think it's really inspiring new ways of working and these like very agile pods uh, to go after big customer problems more quickly to get to solutions faster um, and not, you know, I think it's part of innovation. You know, part of innovation is always, this is how you work. You know, you have to work in a very agile environment and you have to be comfortable with it being good enough to get out there and then improving as you go. Because if you wait for perfection, it's just going right. to slow you down. So that's, that's the method that we're, we're using. Yeah, no, that's interesting to me because I mean, for a lot of traditional retailers that, uh, that's not always like the DNA, right? Like speed, just good enough, get it out the door. Um, and so, yeah, I just wonder for not just Old Navy, but across sort of other brick and mortar chains as well, like how much of that really sticks? Can you, can you shift the DNA? It sounds like you think oh, yeah. you all can. I mean, when you start to see the proof points of scaling curbside BOPUS in a few weeks versus many months, it's powerful. It's powerful. People get excited. You know, they're proud of look at what we did. And then you want to repeat that. You know, you, you just say, look what we learned. And it's it's a constant game of learn, 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 iterate, learn, and and now replicate it somewhere else. So I'm, I'm really excited about what's to come. I, I have a question about Black Friday here from Joe, uh, which is what will Black Friday look like? Um, some <laughs> retailers are pushing shoppers to start their holiday shopping in October. Um, we know Prime Day at Amazon will be in October. There's some other events in October. Is Old Navy doing that? And if so, why? Well, I think there's it's the, the answer to the first question is Black Friday will not look like any other Black Friday ever um, because you can't you can't possibly have that level of first of all, think about the stores, like where it's craziness in the stores and they're packed, that that's not safe. So, so that, and, and plus we have capacity constraints for a good reason. So that's going to be completely different. And, and because of that, I think, you know, everybody has shared that it's going to be a, a much longer season. And in this, in the same way that we're not seeing these spikes um, like we used to with typical holiday peaks or, typical back to school speed. It's, it's, it's not this, you know, like this, it's, it's more steady. Um, we, we imagine that also to, to be the case, it'll need to be the case as we think about a much longer holiday season versus everything, you know, coming down to 10 days. So, um, and, and again, well, you know, we, we don't know how the customer will fully respond. So we have to be ready to be very agile and responsive. And, but we feel really good about our plans. We feel great about our product offering. Uh, and, you know, the customer is, is responding. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interested, like those delivery promises, you know, in December. Yeah. I, 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 well, there's that. What do you that do reality? Yeah. Yeah, I well, mean, and that, and quite frankly, Jason, I mean, that's a huge piece of how we have to plan is with this, with these levels of demand, you know, you're, you have to anticipate multiple scenarios, how much will have to be f fulfilled from stores, at what level can we max out, we're in great shape with our distribution capacity, our teams have done a fantastic job, getting ready for very, very high levels, um, you know, based on the trends that we're seeing. Uh, but we have to be, we have to be ready to be flexible. And we are. Okay. I have a, uh, we have a broader societal question uh, having to do with the election from uh, Heidi Froseth or Froseth. Uh, sorry if my pronunciation is off Heidi. Is Gap going to demonstrate, is Gapping going to demonstrate leadership by giving employees November 3rd off? Policy happens when great big companies at scale do the right thing. Well, Heidi, I don't know if you saw our announcement. Um, we are partnering with Power the Polls. We made a big announcement a few weeks ago. And if you get a chance, uh, I wrote an op-ed for CNN uh, last week. 
I don't, um, I don't know who CNN is. No, sorry. sorry. I probably okay. wasn't supposed to say that. Yeah. But, no, it's um, fine. <laughs> what was, what, so we believe that that is really important. Um, fundamental to Old Navy is, our, is the democratization of style. It is inclusivity and opportunity are core to our values. And there is nothing more important in terms of protecting democracy than, than people's right and ability to vote. So first, we have all headquarters employees have the flexibility to, to vote, you know, any time of day they, they need to on that day. We are giving our store employees three hours off to go vote. And we have partnered with Power to the Polls, which is a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit to um, pay our store employees who apply and are eligible to serve as poll workers for the day. And the reason we're doing that is because we predict, Power of the Polls has predicted that there will be a 500,000 uh, poll worker shortage because of the, um, the typical age of people that serve as poll workers. So we are, we've started a, we, we're starting a movement. We think it's really important to encourage um, companies to, to uh, allow their associates and their employees to to work in the polls and we're paying um our employees to be able to do that thanks nancy we've got a couple more and then i'll i'll close out with one or two of my own um there's one here just about how um how I, I guess Old Navy is managing the high costs associated with COVID, the cleaning. Um, you, you mentioned the changes for social distancing, uh, both not only in stores, but in your distribution centers um, against the uncertain, uncertainty of disposable income. Obviously, you know, I think Old Navy, you know, even with four to six weeks of store closure, sales were only down 5% because of the last quarter, because of the online surge. Um, mm -hmm. But how, how are you balancing that uncertainty with spending against like the expenses to make warehouses and stores safe? Yeah, I think we're making the investments uh, where we know we have to. And uh I would say that, you know, you, we have to look at our P&Ls very differently and we must ensure safety and trust for our customers and for our employees. And that is job number one. And we find offsets in other places. I mean, as, as you said earlier that we shared, you know, margins have been strong. We, we, we didn't have to discount um, as much because of the strength of our product. And that's and that's great. And that's very important, and that helps offset some of those costs. But we're we're not going to um, we're not going to compromise on the safety and well being of our customers and our employees. Um, so, you know, th this is a Jason Del Rey question, uh, starting with a statement, which is: I spend a lot of time covering and thinking about Amazon and Walmart. Um, you know, as is probably obvious to a lot of us part of their goal is to capture as much spend from each customer as possible, right? And maybe that sounds obvious, but they're doing that by, you know, if you're Walmart, um, strong in grocer grocery, now launching, you know, latest private label fashion brand in the last few days. Amazon, you know, private label, everything on top of new grocery. And um, for better or worse, I now, as I'm saying this, realize that this is an Amazon private label brand shirt that I bought last Prime Day. So I wonder, as those behemoths with you know resources that really no other company has, try to move in in different ways into apparel, private label, third party marketplaces. How do you how do you make sure that you stand out for a customer? that is a prime customer or a Walmart plus customer and, and just get sort of sucked into spending more and more with those giants. Yeah. I mean, you stand out because you differentiate because this is what we do. This is what we do. It is our, it is not, you know, 10% of what we do. It's a hundred percent of what we do. Apparel is, is our job. And we, how have, do you, how do you, how do you make that clear to a customer who might not care whether it's 5% of what I Amazon mean, the, the, does? You know, we're, we're curated. We're highly curated. We don't sell everything intentionally. We, you know, we are more like a specialty retail in terms of the assortment level that we offer. And we're not here to be offer everything in the world. So 
the idea is again, you know, somebody who trusts that we have made the right choices for our customer, that they don't have to sift through lots and lots and lots of assortment to find what we needed. We have the best fits across body types. We have the best fabric qualities that, you know, will make you feel comfortable and confident um, that are soft. I mean, we pay attention to every single detail that goes into making, you know, a, a piece of clothing that clothing is very, very emotional. It is, we don't look at it as a commodity. It is emotional. These are the things people wear. Um, and that builds a lot of psychological safety when you feel confident and comfortable in your clothes, you feel confident and comfortable in your life. And so we know those emotional benefits. So that's, we spend time on that and we sweat the details and our customer knows that. And we provide an incredible value um, because of what we're able to do at scale. And uh, that I think is fairly unmatched. And, uh, and then we're a brand that has values, you know, that we talk about our values and we share our values and we love our values. And we, that's, that's how you, that's how brands have to be run. So that's how we look at it. And we share those stories. We share personal stories, the human stories. Yeah. Um, um, you know, you mentioned emotion and human stories and, it, and it just, you know, uh, made me think of, you know, one of the big topics topics of in the business news world right now is, is what's going to, the TikTok saga, right? What's yeah. going to happen? What's going to happen there? What is um, going to happen there? <laughs> um, we could talk about that a little bit later, but um, I am curious when it comes to social media channels, obviously more and more important um, in different ways. I've seen some, you know, TikTok Old Navy uh, collaborations. I'm wondering for you, like what is Old Navy see as exciting and what do you, what is new in, in sort of social channels that you think, you know, has the potential to, to have sort of real meaningful benefit to, to your business? Yeah, I mean, well, TikTok is pretty fun. I mean, people are having fun doing the dance competition. So that's for sure. I think what's we need, could we use some fun in, in 2020? I mean, I mean well, that, seriously. I, I, my, my, I'm, I'm so proud of our team, you know, that runs our, our social, um, you know, creative and, and what they put out there. I mean, I think what's really important is that we do need levity. And part of Old Navy's DNA is fun. Fun and entertainment, it's always, it's been part of, shopping is fun again, is in our original manifesto. And so I think at a time when the world needed a lot of levity, not a little, we were there. And that's where you have to be really like connected to customer zeitgeist. So I think social channels allow you to do that in a way that's highly dynamic. Um, and it's important that people really are connected to the zeitgeist and what's happening, you know, with consumer psyche and what people need. So we've done everything from have, we've done TikTok challenges. We've done interactive, you know, game nights and things that are just fun. And there's more what we see a lot more. There's more to come on that in terms of engaging with the consumer. And, and it's fun to also put out customer challenges like what would they choose, you know, whether it's your associating your sweat pant color or your sweatshirt color with your uh, zodiac sign or whatever it is, highly interactive, highly engaging formats that bring people surprise and delight are can, I think can, can we can we follow you on tiktok yet nancy or is that a 2020 no. is that a 2021 <laughs> thing i i barely post on instagram anymore i don't have time so, but it's fun I mean, those tiktok dance competitions are hilarious they are um yeah, I'm trying desperately to turn my kids into mini TikTok influencers because um, <laughs> so you can retire. I mean, <laughs> you're if, not going to be if, uh, if, if there are any kids talent agents out there, um, influencer coaches, uh, a Jay stage father. You're going to be a stage father. Jason at Rico.net. I there like n there's very little that's below me, so stage father would be totally fine. Um, w let's let's end with um, you know maybe that something that's been uh, surprising to you over, well, this whole world surprising, but I I'm curious when it comes to consumer behavior, um, being so steeped in the apparel business for so long, like you are, was there anything that really, 
really surprised you um, during the last call it six months and then everything <laughs> yeah in terms of and in terms of consumer behavior specifically and maybe mm -hmm. it's something we talked about already but but uh, might be a I good think, place to finish I think that the pace of acceleration on, on behavior trends I, I'm I we follow macro trends you know very closely and lifestyle trends um, the pace of behavior change uh, resulting from sort of a forced situation is, it's remarkable. I don't think any of us have seen anything like this ever. You know, forget living through a pandemic, just the pace of, of behavioral change. That That's exciting. Um, I think it shows what's possible to see, you know, a level of e-com demand accelerated by several years. It's extraordinary. And to see, you know, our stores you know, respond in a way that is unbelievable with the health and safety standards that that we've um, had to operate with. And to see customers so excited to come back and be part of a store and its community is, it's just, it validates that, you know, why stores may not matter and, and our role community by community. So what I'm most inspired through all of this is resilience. It's the human resilience and the power of, of people um, the power of what resilience brings to teams. You know, we talked about seeing the acceleration, it was possible getting curbside rolled out, you know, a matter of weeks versus many months, you know, and people going through the toughest decisions, tough, tough daily decisions where you think, oh my gosh, you know, how do we make the right decision? And, and to get through that and be stronger on the other side, the power of resilience is uh, honestly, I've, it's it's really it's so inspiring and so uplifting. It's 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 the human nature of of what we're all capable of and showing what's possible and the potential that that's that's incredibly powerful. My team, thank you, team. If anybody's watching out there, you are extraordinary. You know, our customers, thank you for being part of this incredible community um, and our employees. And and as I usually do, I, I lied about the last question thing, but I, something just triggered in my head that, you know, this, um, you know, resilience is something that, you know, this country needs a lot of these days and um, we're challenged in many ways. But I think, you know, something I've I've always appreciated during the last six months is when leaders talk a little bit about like really talk candidly about challenges they faced or dark times. And so I, I wonder if you might be able to share just like maybe one or two of the real the toughest conversations or decisions you've had to make during this time and and how you thought about sort of dealing with that. Yeah, I think there are two that really stand out. <clears throat> the first one was the decision on closing stores. Um, none of us have ever been faced with uh, a safety and health situation combined with a, a, a massive business decision material to the point where, you know, you, you shut down the majority of your revenue and what that means and, and, and the triggers that that was putting us into. So I would say that that was those were some of the hardest decisions we had to make as a team and personally. And then separately, because again, you are dealing with safety and, and business, you know, vi both coming together. Um, and then the next one, you know, was around people's livelihoods was the decision when we had, to, when we knew that it wasn't going to be three weeks, it was going to be months, was the furloughs um, that we had to do with our, you know, with our employees. And that those are, those are. <laughs> You don't take those decisions lightly. Those are really, really difficult decisions, livelihoods that, you know, are dependent on you as a leader. Um, so those those by far, I mean, there's nothing that com comes close to that. Anything that is involved with a real big human impact is what weighs on people's minds. Is there is there a long term way to say thank you to those employees? Because, you know, it's it's um. We've seen many companies give bonuses and then, um, you know, the pandemic's still going on and their employees are still coming into stores and dealing with, you know, a certain level of risk. So I just wonder, you talk a lot about how, you know, the personal connection in stores is so important. Like, how do you, how do you make sure your employees actually are feeling that long-term? 
you show it to them every day. You get out there and you visit those stores and you share. If you can't visit them personally, you talk to them and you share the incredible gratitude you have. Our, our teams were so excited to come back to work because their teams are their fa- I mean, this is their community as much as anything else. They are our store leaders, are unbelievable people who just generate this incredible sense of community store by store. And, and the power of getting back in and, and being together as it's like a family for them in many ways um, is really powerful. So sharing that gratitude and that appreciation and knowing that we work for them and, and our job is to make sure that they have everything they need to be, you know, as, as strong and, and positive um, in front of the customer and what they need to do their job every day. So. Well, Nancy, I could go on another hour, but um, I think uh, we should let you and other people go on with the rest of their day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Klarna, for sponsoring this series. And thank you most of all to all the viewers there and um, our attendees, our guests. Um, We'll be back next Wednesday, same time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern with another exciting guest. And in the meantime, catch me on Twitter, Jason at Rico.net for feedback, Del Rey on Twitter, on Rico and Vox.com. See you all soon. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Bye.